Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding is made possible by grants from AM Trust Title, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Colliers International, NYC, Cohen Equities, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Brooklyn, New York, Borough Park, Flatbush, Ah, Sheepshead Bay, PS225, Lincoln High School, University of Hartford, basketball player, all pro in, in high school, all in college. Mailroom in advertising? Copyright? What do I know about copyright? Get to a firm. Work for McCabe, get involved, create commercials, not create commercials, create legendary commercials, donuts, Chuck Schwab, NASDAQ, Volvo, major agency, two wonderful sons and a number of grandchildren, movie director and producer of two winning awards. I got Ron Berger today. Thanks for being here. Mike. That was a wonderful introduction. You actually took my entire life and condensed it into 20 seconds. You know, we, we sometimes do it. So tell me, getting back to the life, tell me about your grandparents and then the butcher, right? Sure, yeah. My father, uh, Alan Berger, uh, the only one I've ever known who spelled his name A-L-L-E-N, uh, and his father was a butcher, Sam Berger, in uh, the Borough Park uh, part of Brooklyn. Uh, my father went to New Utrecht High School and actually played basketball there, so when I was thinking about, you know, as you were going through my basketball history, he uh, he actually started dribbling before I even... So, so you're the second generation yeah. dribbler. So tell me about mom, his family. Uh, my mother's name was Gladys Applebaum. She uh, lived in Flatbush. Her mother, uh, Sarah Applebaum, uh, lived on Kings Highway. Her father's name was Benjamin Applebaum. I don't actually remember what, what he did, except he looked and sounded like Lyndon Johnson. Now, how did mom meet dad? Mom met dad, I believe, at a dance or something, the way people did in, uh, in Brooklyn in those days. My mother went to Madison High School. Uh, as I said, my father went, went to New, to New Utrecht. Utrecht. right? When did they get married? Well, I would think they probably got married in, you know, late 30s, 1940, something now like that. Now, you said to me, your dad worked, uh, there was a place in downtown Brooklyn called Buddy Lee. Correct. Yeah, it was a clothing store uh, in down in what is now sort of the fashionable part of Brooklyn. Uh, in those days, it was it was uh, uh, you know a rough rough neighborhood. Uh, and uh, but Buddy Lee was sort of the clothing store, 
and uh, a lot of the entertainers used to come in uh, and uh, Monty's Venetian room was the Italian restaurant on President Street. Monty made a lot of money apparently went out to the Hamptons and bought Gurney's Inn. Now, but the, the, some of the other customers were uh, buddies were the wise guys, right? Yes, exactly. So that's what I said. They used to go to Buddy Lee. They'd go into Monty's Venetian room. Uh, but the greatest part about him working at Buddy Lee is they used to have tickets to the Brooklyn Dodger games. So as a kid, I grew up as a Dodger fan and was able to go to Ebbets Field, uh, you know, when I was five, six years old. And, and you continued to love the Dodgers over there? Continued to love the Dodgers. I uh, grew up two blocks from Gil Hodges. Uh, before I moved to Sheepshead Bay, I lived on, on Nostrand Avenue and uh, loved the Dodgers and through when they moved to L.A., stayed with them while Koufax and Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale still were on the team, which uh, I guess was the mid-60s, late 60s. Used to listen to the games on a transistor radio uh, when they were in California. And then when Sandy retired, you know, I went to Lafayette, a Brooklyn guy and Jewish Brooklyn guy. I sort of evolved into. Yeah, but you were a Lincoln boy. It's true. Okay, but, but you, you were, when we got together, you said that, and I said to you, you 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 were elevated from Flatbush and you moved to Seacoast. Uh, Atlantic Towers. Atlantic Towers on Avenue Z, on Avenue Z and Thirteenth Street, Street, West uh, East Thirteenth Street. Street. Not far from the the train it was a, absolutely that was one of the attractions. One of the attractions. You walk you know walk to the subway, uh, and you know because in those days, which I you know my mother used to take the train into she worked at the post in the advertising department, uh, but it was yeah it was a, it was a brand three brand new buildings with a swimming pool. Behind. And you lived on the first floor. And I lived on the first floor. When did you get involved with basketball? At PS two twenty five. Yeah, actually, I was a baseball player up until I was about 12 years old. I was very big, tall. I was 5 feet 9 when I was bar mitzvahed. Uh, I threw very hard. I used to play at, uh, in the North Highway Little League, which used to play their games behind James Madison in the field there. Uh, and then when I, when I moved to Sheepshead Bay uh, and I went to 225, everyone there either played softball or basketball. And once I got into... No stickball? Well, that was that was in the neighborhood. This right. was, you know, th this was this was organized. organized. This was well, organized. This was schools. This was, uh, you know, you're on the school team, and and uh, and then I started to play basketball, and and you know, was I guess pretty good at it, and sort of dropped baseball. I think when I was 13, and focused on basketball. And now, even though Sheepshead Bay High had opened up, you had the opportunity to go to Lincoln. Yeah, correct. So I, my street was the borderline street where you had a chance. You could have chosen to go to Sheepshead Bay High School, or you could have gone to Lincoln. But since all the kids that I had gone to 225 with all lived in Brighton Beach, uh, at well, Manhattan Beach, the fancy ones, although there weren't too many fancy ones. To me, it was easy because, you know. How'd you end up when you were a kid on 2nd Street? Well, all these guys that from 225, they lived on Brighton 13th Street, they've lived on Brighton 11th Street, they've lived on Brighton 7th Street, uh, and 2nd Street Park was the park where everyone would go on Saturdays to play ball. It's between Brighton Beach Avenue and, and the boardwalk. So was the Brooklyn equivalent of Rutgers? Uh, it was Rucker, yeah, it was Rucker, it was Reese Park. So but this was the... Nobody from outside came there, whereas great players from other places would go to Rucker or go to Reese Park uh, or even Manhattan Beach in those days. Manhattan, the first quarter, Manhattan Beach, you know, was had the, future the, pros. Growing up, you had some jobs, and you also were lucky through some relative or something for the camps. Tell me about that. Yeah, so what happened was, um, you know, d d nobody from working class, middle, you know, middle class neighbors went to summer sleepaway camp, you know, forget, they didn't know what it was, much less could afford it. So uh, our, our summer was, we'd go to Brighton Beach, we'd go to Brighton Beach Baths, we'd go to Manhattan Beach. You right, know. and to go to Brighton Beach Bath, you had to make sure that you got the stamp you on your hand. the stamp on your hand, right. exactly. You had to do exactly. it the right way to exactly. do that. Exactly. Uh, in fact, you know, people would say to me when I was a kid, you know, where'd you grow? I said, Brooklyn. They said, what'd you do in the summer? I said, we used to go to the beach. They go, there's a beach in Brooklyn? Now I tell people, you know that. Did beach? you have your sun reflector? Well, with, that's, the, with the oil. That, <laughs> yeah, I did. Max's sun parlor was across the street from Brighton Second Street Park. It was a parking lot. They used to have aluminum uh, uh, borders around it, and all the old Jews who couldn't go to Florida would go in and sit in the parking lot 
not with reflectors, but the sun, the, you know, the, the, the aluminum. Right, but well, the aluminum would was. Would protect it, would keep the wind out and make the place. This guy, Max, was a genius. He realized that all these Jewish kids who didn't want to go to, couldn't go to Florida in, in, the, in the winter, he started to put chairs and charge you a dollar an hour to sit on the chair. So the answer is I used to use a reflector. Uh, and I used to sit on these, you know, that was our, that was sort of our winter break. Right, but you said you, you were lucky that you worked at this camp. Yeah, so anyway, so w when I made the basketball team at, at Lincoln, uh, the coach there used to take uh, the team up to a camp called Crane Lake up in uh, West Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and we would get a job as waiters, uh, the team would get a job as, as waiters, and then at night we'd, you know, we'd play league games, and so it gave us a chance to sort of work together as a team, and at the same time. So I did that for a couple of summers, and then I, I met a guy in Manhattan Beach who owned a camp called Timberlake, and uh, he must have known me from playing basketball at Lincoln, and said that they were looking for a waiter to work at Timberlake, but to only wait on the owners of the camp and their guests, which turned out to be a pretty cool job because the guests were the Jenny Grossinger's kids went to that camp, and Milt Kutch's kids went to that camp. So. I was like a real waiter, not waiting on kids, but waiting on adults most of the time. So you graduated Lincoln in 67, right? Correct. And in 67, you got, a, you got a scholarship to University of Hartford. Correct. Talk to me about Hartford. So I uh, went up to Hartford as a freshman, uh, September of 67, uh, which was an interesting year. Uh, it was... Uh, the year the Red Sox uh, had a terrific, and my three roommates were all from Newton, Massachusetts. And uh, Carl Yastrzemski had the trip. I had to listen to these guys bust my chops about how great the Red Sox were. And I had to listen to their accents, which were hard enough to figure out at that time. Uh, but I played ball. I was a psychology major and, uh, you know, never a great student, but, you know, good enough that, to sort of get that, by. That summer, you worked for the American Bible? Yeah, after my freshman year, I got a job driving a truck, a delivery truck for the American Bible Society over here on uh, Columbus Avenue. Uh, and uh, they used to, uh, used to take the, the, the mail from the Bible Society out to their warehouse in, uh, in New Jersey uh, and, uh, and then bring, it, bring back what they had. But it was had. convenient because it was near where Karen lived. Terrific, yeah. It was, it was, uh, I had started to date a, a girl named Karen Rosenberg um, who lived in Fairlawn, New Jersey. And uh, so my, the truck sort of had a life of its own. As I would leave Wayne, which is where I wound up living later, through no, you know, no, no coincidence or just coincidence actually. And I used to drive after I picked up the Bibles that had to come back to the building in New York. I would go over to Fairlawn and have lunch with her, or a very quick lunch, and then I'd get back to the city. So that was the first summer. What happens the second summer? Mom's working at the New York Post. Right. So my mother's working at the New York Post, and she calls me. Uh, one day and she says uh, a friend of mine got a job as personnel manager uh, at an advertising agency on Madison Avenue called Carl Alley. Uh, there was no human resources people in those days. They were personnel managers and they're looking for somebody to work in the mailroom. Uh, and the agency was totally innovative that a four-day week you'd work from 8.30 to 6. Uh, you deliver mail, and uh, they paid something like sixty, sixty-five dollars a week. And I said, "Perfect." Um, sign on. Sign me up. So I used to take the D train in from Sheepshead Bay, the same short walk from uh, Avenue Z and 13th Street to the subway, and uh, get off at 49th Street and uh, I guess 8th Avenue and walk across. And needless to say, all the advertising agencies had. Baseball teams. All the, exactly. It was it, the entry point for careers in, in advertising were mailroom, to softball teams, to basketball teams, to career opportunities. And I was fortunate enough. I was, a, you know, obviously a, a, a pretty good athlete as a kid, uh, and I wound up playing center field on the Carl Alley softball team. And through that, uh, and I worked in the mailroom for two summers, meeting everybody from you know, the, the copywriters to the president of the agency, and uh, which was, you know, an incredible opportunity, um, you know, growing up. So do you get the copyright opportunity while you're there or after you leave? Yeah, so after my junior year, so, which was my second summer at, at Carl Alley, uh, I go back to school and I've now made uh, 
you know, some good real friends. And, and one of the guys uh, was a copywriter named Frank DiGiacomo. And uh, Frank said to me, you know, you got one year left, what are you going to do? And I said, to tell you the truth, I, I don't know. You know, my ambition was to be a sports writer, but I had no idea how to do that. And he said, well, you know, why don't you think about becoming a copywriter? And if you're interested, I'll help you put together what is called a portfolio, um, which I did over the course of my senior year. Every time I would come back from uh, for any kind of break, I would bring my work back and he would help. And and, uh, and at the end of the you know, at the end of when I graduated, I figured, you know, I wound up with nothing else to do, getting a job in advertising. You and Karen are getting married, right? And then you took the summer off, which right. was a, a criminal shonda, uh, as it, they it, would right. say. It was a big announcement I made that I was going to start my career and we were going to get married, but I thought the good way to start it would be by taking the summer off. So now this is 1971, right? Correct. So at Carl Alley. Right. I get my first job uh, at Carl Alley, which was the agency. I worked in the mailroom, uh, and I started, I guess, the fall of 71. Uh, and I was a, uh, I had a, 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 I was a junior copywriter that I'd been hired on a trial basis. And the first accounts I worked on were Pan Am and, uh, and, uh, Fiat. What happens after? Later on, you meet somebody else. Is it Ed McCabe? Yeah. So a couple of years later, um, um, my phone rings in the office one day and a guy, I pick it up and he goes, Ron, I see, he says, this is Ed McCabe. And, uh, I figured it was a friend of mine busting my chops about, you know, uh, like imitating, because Ed was, at that point, his agency was the hottest agency in the business, and he was, you know, one of the top two or three copywriters and the youngest ever to be inducted into the Copywriters Hall of Fame. And what happens? He gives you, uh, gives you an opportunity, right? Yeah, he says to me, uh, you know, I'm looking through all the awards books and everything I liked you've, you've done. Um, do you want to come over and talk? Uh, and I said, sure. And I went over there one night. It was a Thursday night. Uh, their offices was 803rd Avenue. And there was a big advertising award show at the Waldorf, which was right around the corner, right after my interview with him. And uh, he says to me, I'd like you to come to work here. Uh, I've got a job that's the best job in the business and the worst job in the business uh, because it's going to be working directly for me. And... Uh, I was making a little bit of money. He asked me how much. I told him $17,000. When he stopped laughing, he said, I'll give you 23000 but I need to know tomorrow. And I said, I can't let you know tomorrow because I've got to go home. I've got to talk to my wife. So I leave. I go to the award show. To make a long story short, uh, his agency winds up winning like every award, uh, sweeping everything. And I'm sitting like, you know, in the bleachers at, this, at the Waldorf and I go home and I say to Karen, you know, I've got this opportunity and I just don't think I can turn it down. He's very difficult to work for, but, you know, I think this is one of the shots we've got to take. So I took the job and, and I went to work there uh, in 1975. And what happens later on? So I worked for Ed for two years and he was true to his word. It was the greatest job and the worst, worst job, uh, depending on the day. Uh, I learned a lot, and then in 1976-7, I get a call from uh, somebody at what is now uh, Ali Gargano, the agency I had worked at previously, and they want me to come there and work on the Barney's account, which they had just won. And, you know, for a lifelong New Yorker, uh, Barney's was... Not just an. But you remember Barney's Boys Town. This I, was this was a change. It was right. It was releasing the women's shop and right. Well, the, yeah, the well, ads so, yeah. So we were actually we mornings. actually were with the agency as that transition happened. So when Fred Pressman was now running Barney's, who was Barney's son, um, Fred's vision was to build a world class uh, men's clothing store. Uh, and bring in direct designers like Giorgio Armani. And, you know, I did the first commercial that introduced Armani to America in 77, 78. Uh, and then about two years later, they're still on 7th Avenue and 17th Street at the time, free parking, free alterations, which is the radio commercials used to say. Uh, his wife, Phyllis, had this idea that, that they should open up a women's store. It's called a women's place. Uh, they had bought the building on 17th Street. And thought they should have a store that women 
could go to not just when they were going to shop for the men or shop for their sons at, at Boys Town, as you said. Then when do you and your buddies go into business? So we, I am at, back at Ali Gargano for 10 years, um, probably you know, sort of the foundation of, of the, my career at that point. Is that when uh, you did the Dunkin' Donuts? Correct. So 1980, uh, you know, did the Time to Make the Donuts campaign. Uh, Which is, went into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Went into Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Fred the Baker, you know, the campaign, you know, I probably did eight, ten of the commercials, ran for 13, 14 years. You know, the line, Time to Make the Donuts, has become iconic, not just about people who make donuts, but people who do everything. You know, whatever, you get up in the morning, and you got to Right, and then work. you also had the Volvo. Commercial. Right. So then we, in 86, we, um, three of us leave, uh, myself, Tom Mester and Barry Vittieri all leave Ali Gargano and start our own agency with another partner, uh, Mester and Vittieri, Burger Carey. And, uh, prior to that, we had, you know, we had worked on the Reagan and Bush campaign. We met Wally there it would, with Reagan in 84. That's where we met Wally Carey. We opened our agency in 86. And uh, some of our first clients several years later were MCI and Volvo and, and uh, you know, and, and many others. Over, but the over cute the story is the Regina vacuum business. Right. I was 36 years old and they'd left a, you know, a decent job and made, you know, was making decent money and decided we were going to start an agency, except we had no clients and no revenue and therefore no salaries. And... My son Ryan was 10 and my son Corey was seven. And when I think back now, how courageous that was to do and how supportive Karen was at the time. Uh, and obviously still has, we're married 45 years. So, um, but at the time you just think this is something you want to do. So we needed to pick up business and I knew a number of people in, in the agency world and I wrote all of them a letter uh, and said, Listen, we know the way new business works. You get, you know, especially if you, you know, you're a big agency, you get a lot of inquiries. Some you can't handle for conflict. Some you're not interested. They're too small. Anything that seems halfway interesting to you, please send it our way. The only response I got was from a guy named Tom McGilligut, who had a terrific agency in Minneapolis called Fallon McGilligut. And he referred a, 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 a company called Regina, which made the Regina vacuum cleaners in Rawway, New Jersey. We have a couple of meetings, they hire us, they pay us $40,000 a month, uh, which sort of- Gave was, some, gave some yeah, foundation. Gave some it. foundation, and more importantly, gave us a, a national account, because two months later, uh, we have our first commercial for Regina Vacuum Cleaners running on national television. And then the agency's growing, okay? You're involved with the creation of Ad Week which was an important situation. And then you're involved with, okay, there was Volvo, there was NASDAQ, there was Chuck Schwab, Schwab Chuck, Chuck. okay? You were involved with Jaguar and all of, yeah. all of this. And then how do you and your, your buddy from Brooklyn, Dan, uh, decide to go into the movie business with the boys of Second Street? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's an interesting, in some ways it's a natural progression. In some ways, you know, some, sometimes these things never happen. Um, Dan and I have been friends since the seventh grade. Uh, he was on the PS225 team with me, uh, and he went into the PR business and I went into advertising and we sort of worked together on a number of things. And one day, I guess it was about 2000, uh, he said to me, you ever thought about doing a movie? And I said, I haven't really, but you know, I've spent my whole life doing commercials. What are you thinking of me? He says, you know, I think there's a, a, a film to be made about the guys we grew up with. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, you know, and he started to tell me some of the stories. And, and since, since my parents had moved out of Brooklyn when I went away to college, I wasn't as aware of what was going, what had gone on. Anyway, he, he said, let's, you know, let's think about giving it a shot. We put up a little bit of money, you know, sort of seed money just to begin to go out and shoot some of the interviews. And he would go shoot the interviews and I would look at the tapes that he was sent back. And since I had been a creative director, I was sort of used to looking at dailies. And Mike, I sat there and, and these are guys I grew up with and knew for 40, I was blown away by, by their stories and how interesting they were in telling the stories. Right, the story talks about five guys and one woman, right? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, five or six guys. It spans uh, 
sort of a five year period of in Lincoln, you know, I graduated in 67. There was guys who graduated in 64, 64 like of which you're one of them. Uh, not in the movie, but in real life, you actually graduated in 64. Um, and uh, it's really, you know, in some ways, the story of a generation. The, the 60s is an interesting decade because there was the innocence of the early 60s. Uh, and then it all changed in 63 when John Kennedy got shot. Uh, and then in the mid 60s, late 60s, Bobby Kennedy got killed, Martin Luther King got killed, the Vietnam War happened, uh, and in fact, you know, if you've seen any of the Vietnam War documentary at Ken Burns, it just brings it all back to life. So, so the the film sort of captures the story of this generation through this handful. So this of, comes out in 2003. Comes out in 2003. It's in Sundance in 2003 and is bought by Showtime. Right, and then after that, you and Dan put together the the boxing Emil Griffith yeah so we we having successfully uh, self-produced and self-directed the first movie and getting it in 10 film festivals and on Showtime uh, he said you know why don't we try another one you know I remember the fight the Emil Griffith Benny Pret fight which was on the Gillette Cavalcade of Sports live uh, uh, on Friday Night Fights and it was a very famous story where Pret uh, accused Griffith, said Griffith was gay, uh, which was, you know, sort of unheard of in boxing, right. still unheard of. Uh, and uh, they had three fights. The last one was in Madison Square Garden on March 28, 1962. And uh, Perrette got knocked out, got knocked into a coma and died 10, 10 days right. later. In 2007, I think you and you were involved with Marty Markowitz in the city in the creation of this advertising high school. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I've always tried to do was get involved in the business, not just in the agency side of it, but in the industry and how can we improve the, 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 the things the industry does in a large sense. And uh, we had this idea to start a, an advertising high school uh, as part of the career and technical education program that the DOE had created under Mike Bloomberg when he was mayor. So Marty Markowitz, who's a bit of a showman himself, loved the idea and said, I'll put up $2 million dollars to fund the school as long as it's in Brooklyn. Right. Well, what's it called, the school? It's called the High School for Innovation and Advertising Media, and it sits on the Canarsie High School campus. Right. Now let's talk a, bit, a little bit about family. you got the two sons who are following in the footsteps. Yeah, so I have two sons. Ryan uh, is the older one, and Corey's the younger one. Um, they both have gone into the industry, uh, grew up as basketball players uh, in high school and partially in college. Uh, worked for me as interns and have now sort of created their own careers. Ryan's involved with a, an influence of a uh, marketing platform called Hyper, as well as his own digital company called Burger Shop. Uh, and Corey is managing director of, a, of an advertising agency here in New York called Pereira Odell. They're married. Uh, Ryan's married uh, to Amy, the only two people who actually grew up in the same town named Wayne, Wayne? Pennsylvania and Wayne, New Wayne, Jersey. New Jersey. And Corey is married to Jessica. Uh, Corey has two girls, Skylar and Elle, uh, six and two. And Ryan and Amy have three children, Cassidy, nine, uh, Charlie, who's six, and Winnie, who's a year and a half. So I get high marks for remembering all the grandkids. That's and great. And it's very important. And what's really great is to have somebody who grew up in Brooklyn, who continues to be Support Brooklyn and support education, and thanks for being here today. I appreciate it, Mike. It's good to see you, and I really enjoyed it.